This video is the third in our series about color vision. It is about a widely used color map called the CIE chromaticity diagram. In the first video we talked about the basics of color. In the second we covered color matching which took us to color space and ended at the color map, the chromaticity diagram. In this video we will spend more time exploring features of the chromaticity diagram. The reward will be a deeper understanding of how colors relate to one another and how color vision is studied. Let us start with a brief review of how we got to the color map. This is covered in more detail in the previous video. Everything started in our color matching lab. We found that we could match any color in the spectrum shown on the left by combining different amounts of three primary colors, red, green, and blue. That result is shown in this important graph. This is clearer with an example. Take spectral yellow at 580 nanometers. Here in our lab, we set that as our test color, and we could match that yellow with a mixture of equal amounts of red and green. That is shown on the color matching graph. The arrow points to the spot where red and green are added in equal amounts, which is at 580 nanometers seen on the x-axis. It all fits nicely together, or almost. If you look closely at the graph, there's an area where the red line has negative values. That means we couldn't match this region in our starting setup. It required adding one of the primaries to the test color, in this case red, then using blue and green to match the modified color. Numerically, that's why the red line is in negative territory, which is an inconvenience. Because these are all numbers, some very clever people made a transformation that moved the negative values into positive territory. This was based on creating a new set of imaginary primary colors, X, Y, and Z. Don't worry about that, this is only about the numbers. Using the values from the color matching graph, those same smart people went on to make a color map that everyone could use to describe a specific color in a standard way. The mapping process started in three-dimensional color space. While that is nice conceptually, it's not very practical, so they made a two-dimensional map. That is a plane passing through 1.0 on each axis. Instead of using red, green, and blue, they used the X, Y, and Z primaries, so all the numbers stayed in positive territory. Making the map involved taking the numbers from the X, Y, Z color matching graph and plotting them as follows. Here we go mapping the vectors in X, Y, Z space, marking where they pass through the unit plane. A vector near the Z axis would be bluish, toward the Y axis would be greenish, and toward the X axis would be reddish. As you plot all the vectors corresponding to the spectral color matches, that traces out a line called the spectral locus. In other words, that line corresponds to the colors of the spectrum mapped onto our two-dimensional color diagram. Contained within this border is the full gamut of colors we are capable of seeing. This color map is called the chromaticity diagram. Here is the diagram presented in two dimensions. Instead of being an equilateral triangle, it is graphed as a right triangle because that is easier to work with. Because this is a plane, the position of any color is defined by two values, x and y. The third number from the tri-stimulus values is used to represent luminance. The three values together completely define a color. Let's take a closer look at the diagram. The line around the outer edge represents the pure spectral colors with their wavelengths labeled, going from blue on the lower left to green around the top, then yellow and red on the lower right. The, the line that crosses the figure along the bottom is created using various mixtures of blue and red. These colors are not in the spectrum, which is why there are no wavelengths labeled. More about that in a moment. Here is the chromaticity diagram with all the colors filled in. Contained within the figure is the full gamut of colors that we can see, all neatly specified by two numbers X and Y. This model was defined in 1931 by the International Committee on Illuminance. 
These are the clever people we mentioned before. The initials in French are CIE. The full name of this color map is the CIE chromaticity diagram. Now that we've got this far, you're about to be rewarded with some cool insights into color. You remember that white was created by the addition of equal amounts of all colors. In this case, equal amounts occur at x equals one-third and y equals one-third. This is called equal energy white and is an important reference point. We will look at more whites later on. About the line that closes the bottom of the figure. These colors do not exist in the rainbow, but they can be matched by mixtures of red and blue, making a range from purple, magenta, and red. This is often called the purple line. None of the colors in this triangle are in the spectrum, so they are called non-spectral colors. Now, you have the landmarks. Let's pick a color. Picking a spot at random, say x equals 0 0.1 and y equals 0 0.3, that specifies a color in the region of cyan. Specifying color that everyone can agree upon is one of the main purposes of creating this system. Let's pick our next spot with a purpose. The color of red in a stoplight is specified by the Institute of Traffic Engineers to have these color coordinates. Putting it in a region of highly saturated spectral red. In fact, here are the entire color specifications for traffic lights showing the allowable range for each color choice, amber, green, and so on. Now, if we want to mix two colors, call them A and B on the map, if they are in equal amounts, the resulting color, labeled C, will be at the midpoint of the line connecting the two colors. If we choose a color in the green region and a color in the red, as labeled in the diagram, joining the two, the midpoint color is yellow. Another way of showing a red plus green makes yellow. The same works for the other combinations we showed in the additive color mixing section. Red plus blue makes magenta, and blue plus green makes cyan. Let's pick another color, labeled D here. W representing the value of equal energy white, though white varies with a light source, which we'll explain in a moment. If you make a line starting at W, going through the chosen color D, the place where it intersects the spectral locus tells you the dominant wavelength of that color. It's like taking a fully saturated color from the spectrum at that wavelength and adding white. Another item. Take a point on the spectrum. In this case, take blue at around 470 nanometers. Make a line through white, and where it intersects the spectrum on the opposite side is its complement. In this case, yellow at about 575 nanometers. Another way to view this is that adding blue and yellow together makes white. That is a property of additive complementary colors we talked about in the first video. Now let's go back and look at the primaries that were chosen to create the original color matches. The wavelengths were 700 nanometers for red, 546 for green, and 435 for blue. Connect those dots, and what do you have? The only colors that can be made using these primaries lie within this triangle. Take a moment and digest that thought. Color mixing can only create a new color that lies in between the two starting colors, which means that red, green, and blue primaries can only make a color inside this triangle. That leaves a significant part of the blue-green region that lies outside the RGB triangle and therefore cannot be matched. Remember in our color matching diagram there was a part of the spectrum that required the addition of red to the test color to make a match? Looking at the chromaticity diagram, can you see how that now makes sense? For example, take a color, say G in the diagram, in the blue-green region outside the RGB triangle. Adding red to it would bring it to the RGB triangle, where it can then be matched by blue plus green. Your color TV and computer monitor also work on the RGB scheme. Here are the coordinates of the National Television Standard from 1953, when color was new. They have since been changed a little, but the idea is the same. This triangle represents the limitations of what colors your TV is able to display. 
Now let's return to the color white. The first white we looked at was the theoretically nice equal energy white. One of the interesting things about human color vision is that there's a whole range of colors we are capable of calling white. One way of thinking about this is to consider the range of light bulbs that we call white from tungsten filament to fluorescent warm white and cool white. The CIE helped deal with this issue by defining a set of standard values for white. When something is heated up enough, it will start to glow with a certain color. There's a physical model that describes the color created at a specific temperature. Probably the most familiar example is the filament of a light bulb. It's made of tungsten and radiates at 2,856 degrees Kelvin. That's called its color temperature. To relate that to the CIE diagram, here are the CIE standard illuminants, points A, B, and C. In other words, this is a range of colors that can all be seen as white. Point A is the color of a tungsten light. Note it is in the region of yellow-orange. Point B is the color value for direct sunlight. Point C was intended to represent average daylight, but it was later superseded by a D series. The most commonly used is D65, which does a better job of representing average daylight, equivalent to 6,500 degrees Kelvin. To be complete, equal energy white is at about 5,500 degrees. That's kind of abstract, so here's an example to help visualize those points. This is a photo I took indoors in a museum lit by tungsten light. You get the impression that it has a somewhat yellow cast. As we are obliged not to use flash, and they will not let me carry the painting outdoors, the next best thing is to use my photo software to change the color temperature. This is a photo at CIE standard B, as it would look in sunlight. Side by side, you can see it is less yellow. And here it is at CIE D65. But when you're standing in the museum, the yellow cast of the first photo is not so apparent. That relates to how your brain perceives color, a phenomenon called color constancy, which we will cover in a later video. In conclusion, the color map, otherwise known as the chromaticity diagram, is a very useful creation. First, it gives us a common language to describe color. Second, it shows us fundamental properties of our sense of color. In our next video, we will talk about color vision cones to sense color, and the opponent channels to sort them. In this video, I have only covered the highlights. If you want to read more, here are selected references about color science, and my favorites for general coverage of light, color, and vision.